What's up, guys? I'm Jamie Bedingfield. This is Too Many Words, my podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you're new to the show, welcome. Go on about writing and life and this and that. And um, then I talk to a guest. And um, la- re- recently, I've been getting a lot of a lot of comments from you guys. You've been posting questions on Twitter or email. And some episodes I answer questions, some I don't, and there's been a little bit of confusion, and I'm not going to be able to get to every one, but what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to answer to an episode. So this way there's some consistency, and, uh, you know, I'll pick a couple and talk about it. So format update for you. But yes, the guest today is Richard Kadri. He is an incredibly talented writer. Um, He is author of a ton of awesome books. Look him up. Read his books. He's got um, some of the titles in his total is in, um, so far, it's eight book series. It's still continuing. Sandman Slim. Um, His recent release just came out, um, the eighth book in the series, which is the Perdition Score. And I just finished um, reading. I had finished reading it shortly before talking to him. Incredible installment in the series and uh, urban fantasy complex characters and pretty kick-ass story structure so if you haven't read them read them and if you have uh you know reach out to me on twitter or my new facebook page so uh Finally, your requests have been answered. Too Many Words is now has a Facebook page, which makes reaching out to the show super easy. And, you you know, instead of emailing, you can just pop in there. My email, you know, if you still email, it, it's going to be a slower response than if you go to the Facebook page. My inbox right now is nuts. And so that can be looked up easily at Too Many Words Pod, which is the same as the Twitter account. Makes it nice and simple. Took me a little bit longer to to learn that. But yes, the same names for different sites, super convenient. So yes, Too Many Words Pod, reach out to the show. Let me know. Chat with me about the books. Sandman Slim Series, awesome series. And he has other titles out as well that are awesome. So check it out. And I will have that conversation for you in a little bit here. I got to, you know, work through some of my stuff and, of course, get to those emails, those messages. And um, the first one um, is from a super loyal loyal listener, Leslie, and she's been going through um, the loss of her husband. And she has been reaching out to me, talking to me about grief. And in general, grief has been on my mind. Um, I'm... I'm in a healthier place with it. I really am. And I wouldn't say that I'm over it. I don't think that happens. I once read a quote, something along the lines of grief isn't something to get over. It's something to learn to live with. Um, But it does get easier. I don't feel swallowed by it anymore. So there is that. Um, uh, But she wrote, Jamie, do you ever feel totally fine like your normal self? And then all of a sudden you're a mess. And yes, I do feel that way, um, especially, you know, in those first six months. But even now, I can just be going about my business. And then for whatever reason, a song, a smell, a memory, a particular day. And then, you know, I'm I'm there and I'm missing and I'm remembering. And uh, I have there's a few people in my life right now that are they're coping with some major loss. And the The thing that I think is most important through all of it, because grief is, it's going, you have to process it and everybody processes it differently. But the most important thing while you're processing it is being patient with yourself. It's incredibly important to be patient with yourself. Uh, There is no right action and you just have to hang in there and, you know, patience, patience with self. And, you know, that's really with everything. It's really good to be patient with yourself. It helps to have your own back. But, uh, you know, thanks for re- reaching out, Leslie. And, uh, you know, hang in there. Be kind to yourself while you process this. And uh, jumping subjects, I got a question about writing. And this question is from Anthony. And he said, I have been working on a book for a while now. And I am stuck. I don't know 
well, how to get to my next place. And I, I tried writing backwards, like you've mentioned in a previous episode, and that didn't help. What should I do? I would say if you're really struggling with seeing scenes and sequences, step away from the story and pay attention to just work with your characters and the world itself. Get more acquainted there and perhaps you'll find what you need to find. Um, walking away and just letting yourself be also really helps. It In the moment when you're frustrated, it seems counterintuitive because it's like, well, if I walk away, I'm not going to be writing. But you will. Your mind will take that release, hopefully do something pretty cool with it. Walking away from me always helps. And listening to music also helps. You know, similar mood, vibe that you're going for or that you're aiming for. Tune into some music there and just let your mind unravel. Yep. All right. So, and a good amount of you know that I've stopped the weekly episodes of Elliot Granger and the Clues Brigade. And the reason is because my gut was telling me that I needed to take her out of a weekly serial and really spend time with her and her world. And and she needs book treatment. Um, and part of that is isolation. <laughs> so I definitely can tell that some of you are disappointed and, you know, there was no neat stop to the episodes. And for that, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, not trying to make anybody angry, but at the same time, I got to pay attention to what's right. So hang in there. And then as soon as I have updates on when the book will be released, you'll be the first to know. I've been thinking a lot about humanity um, and, hu- you know, human behavior, m- our motivations, our desires, and kind of what we're made of. A while back, there was a report that a tiger had got out at his due and attacked somebody. And, and some of the reaction was, well, it's a tiger. And, you know, we do that a lot with animals. Oh, they're dogs. Oh, they're cats. Oh, we're people. I got my head plugged into the news half the time. And there's all these stories. And forget just what's happening in the country, which that alone is troubling. You know, looking looking at November and it hurts my head. You know, I'm saying let's just... Uh, Let's bring Amy Poehler in there. Give her a term for a bit. It's concerning just in our own country. But, you know, all over the world, there's whole towns and buildings and parades and everything just getting wiped out by anger. And, you know, we're scratching our heads and we're talking about this and we're pointing fingers other places. And it's like, you know, and I'm not condoning violence in any stretch at all. Absolutely not. Am I saying that? But I'm just saying humans are predators. We're predators. And, um, you know, what do we do? We turn on each other. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of time spent dissecting all these different areas. And it's not as easy as dividing different acts and reasons into categories. It's not as simple as that. And I think when, as you know, we're trying to figure out reasons and we're striving for some sort of answer, we look to a simple to to a simple conclusion and it's just often sets us up for failure and for disappointment because it isn't that simple and an understanding for complex issues is perhaps you know the first steps of finding solutions i mean part of the reason why i'm spending so much time (laughs) paying attention to humanity and human behavior and tuning into different aspects of you know What's going on today is that I'm, you know, I'm world building and in order for me to properly world build my world, I need to build a world and then destroy it. So I'm looking (laughs) at different, you know, avenues to that and how it's not just one simple thing. It's hate on top of environmental and it's it's just different things like that. And it's partly because that's kind of what my brain has been obsessing about anyway. Now on that note of complex human beings and deep worlds, let's go over to the conversa- my conversation with Richard Cantry. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm, gr- I'm very happy to be here. Oh, I've been stoked. Um, first off, I want to say congratulations on the new, uh, your new release, The Perdition Score. Thanks. It's, 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 uh, it's fun to have out. I've been working on it for a while. Yeah, I bet. After, you know, putting all that work in, it's it's exciting to get it out there. 
Yeah, finally. It's 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 sort of like until it's out there, it's still sort of sitting on your brain. Yeah. And, and uh, people want to ask about it. It's like, I can't say anything. <laughs> you know, once it's out, we can talk about it. But till then, it's all this giant secret. Anticipation at its best. Yeah. And that uh, you've been uh, you've been touring around for it recently. Yeah, I just pretty much finished that up last week, although I'm going to San Diego Comic Con uh, at the end of this week, and that'll sort of wrap up uh, the tour for this one. Oh, nice! I, uh, I actually I was uh, poking around your site today, and I saw that I just missed you in Seattle. I was like, oh, if I had just checked it uh, last week. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, we missed each other. I just finished Perdition Score. I loved it. I gotta say, is I think it was one of my favorites of the series so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really, uh, I really enjoyed Stark's inner battle. Yeah, well, it's just going to get worse from here, so... Uh, or better. <laughs> or better. We'll see. Well, his overall growth through the whole series has been pretty fascinating to watch, and I've enjoyed how, um, how gradual it's been, because nothing feels, nothing feels like there's no... You stick to his character so well, and I'd imagine through eight books, that can be challenging at times. Well, it's challenging... When you are trying to let him change, when you're when you're trying to let the guy grow, I mean, from the first book to this book, he's gone from a clinically insane person <laughs> to a relatively functional victim victim of massive PTSD, and is actually for the first time in his life trying to deal with it, which is kind of amazing for him. And I was surprised, you know, sometimes your characters surprise you, and the fact that. Uh, he would kind of plunge into the uh, plunge into the beginnings of therapy. Uh, really surprised me, but of course things That's get fun. in his way because everything gets in his way. Yeah, in general, I'm I'm drawn to stories that feature complex characters, and I mean he's complex at the best. I he's just uh, he's awesome. Thank you very much. When you started writing uh, Sam Anselm, did you like, anticipate that there would be so many? Well, you, when you start a series, um, you you want to write a few, but the fact is, I didn't know. My first contract for, for the Sandman Slim was for three books. Okay. So I didn't know how far I could take it. Once we passed those three and they liked them and they did all right, then I knew uh, I could expand and do you know a larger story arc, the, the sort of original large story arc that I had in mind. But with book three, it all could have ended right there. You were signed for three. Did you have all three written already, or was it the first one with plans to go to three? Oh God, I had no. I I, I, okay. had, I didn't have all three. I mean, book two was the single hardest thing uh, I've ever written in my life. I'd never written a sequel before. It was really a, a really difficult process, man. Um, I was. It was the hardest thing I've ever written and kind of terrifying. <laughs> Book three was hard in its own right, but but not in that terror-filled way that book two was, where I writing a series, you have to take responsibility for all the stuff you did to your character in, in the previous book. Totally. And I never had to do that before. So I could I could do all kinds of horrible things to people and just <laughs> leave them at the end of the book. Now I had to carry it forward and see how it affects them in the future and, and see how it makes them better, it makes them worse. Um, and that, that in itself was, was kind of terrifying. I can't tell you, I gotta say, I, that brings me comfort to hear that you had such trouble with uh, book two. I just recently finished the first draft of the second in a series and I felt like I wanted to rip my hair out. It was incredibly challenging every time I sat down at the computer. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, I think the first time you, you do that, it's just it's just going to blow your mind. Well, it took me su by surprise, too, because here I was thinking, you know, like I have all these characters in the world already. You know, that part, you know, is kind of done. But no, it's you then have to take it and, you know, not only transform it, but into something that actually makes sense. Exactly. And again, let, let both the story and the people evolve with the story and how do the people evolve? I mean, one of the things I really was I, I was concerned about with Stark is you see in so many fantasy series that as it goes on, 
you have a character who gets more and more powerful until after a few books, they're just godlike. <laughs> and yep. I absolutely did not want to do that with Stark. So I was always aware that what you know, if I gave him more strength, uh, I had to take something away. You know, I had to hurt him in some way totally. to keep him from becoming that that absurd fantasy character. Well, I gotta say, when I read the, you know, when I read the very first one, you know, it starts with such a with such a bang, and he's, you know, quite the being already. So I was like interested, really curious, you know, because sometimes when series start, you know, in such a hot place, um, things get very just like they kind of go off the rails. Um, in the future books, but yours doesn't do that at all. You're, and you do, I mean, some crazy, crazy stuff happens, but it like all, you just pull it all together. It's, it's impressive. Well, that's the fun is to just, you, you throw all that stuff out there and then you have to sort of rein it all back in at some point. It, it's, it's, it can be difficult and, and kind of drive you crazy, but, it, but if you do it right, it can be a game too and really fun. Definitely. Well, the, uh, Passionate, passionate and obsession. There's, they share a fence. Yes. <laughs> if you, uh, and this might be, I don't know, but uh, was there one part in the Perdition score in particular that you had like the most fun, you know, working on? Um, okay, if you haven't read it, I'm going to give a huge spoiler right now. Oh, man, I didn't even think about that. So, like, turn the volume down for, like, the next minute, and uh, I'll talk about it. So, uh, yeah, I'll time it out. I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the, at the clock right now, so I'll do it for one minute. Nice. And it will stop. How's that? That sounds good. That sounds good. Okay. Good call. Turn down the volume. Um, it wasn't fun, but it was really emotionally satisfying um, to write about Hesediel's death because I really liked that character an awful lot. And for her to sacrifice herself the way she did really meant a lot to me because Stark had had so much trouble with angels and to have to have one that would do that for for Stark and humanity and and you know uh, was a real uh, was a really interesting moment for me to write I got to say um I was thinking of that when I when the question formed in my head because that was just inc- it was such an incredible uh scene and it made it was like it came across that you really just kind of lost yourself when you were putting that scene together so okay we have to stop talking about that. Uh, okay <laughs> all right and we're Hello. back to non-spoilers you can you can turn your uh sound back up and yes you uh, the one thing i will say is yes you're right it meant a lot to me to write that scene um i was very careful so i can that's, yeah. that's all the rest i can say um but yeah no this is uh because i would say other than this one aside from the first one which i you know is definitely on like you know my, they're all great but on my favorite list is uh, Kill City Blues is not only okay. one of my favorite in the series, but it's like one of my favorite books. It's so much fun. Thank you. That was a, a, a weird one that actually was inspired by Guillermo del Toro. Really? Yeah. I heard him. I forget which movie it was. I mean, it was he's done commentaries for I think it was the first Hellboy movie. Where it was a special edition. Yeah. He'd already done he'd already done one commentary for Hellboy. So he kind of for this new edition where he recorded a new one, a uh, new commentary, he just kind of dispensed with talking about the movie. And for an hour and a half, he talked about gothic literature. And it was really interesting because like most people, I pretty much knew Mary Shelley from from that period. And he talked about a lot of stuff, the Castle of Toronto, the monk, and some other stuff. And I got, I found it very interesting and I went and read up on Gothic literature and it occurred to me that it'd be really fun to try and do a Sandman Slim book in a kind of a Gothic milieu. And what I tried to do with Kill City itself was to create that kind of Gothic castle world, um, that you would find in, in, you know, uh, in, in one of those old books, like basically a haunted castle. Yeah, well, I would say you knocked that oh, out of the okay. park. It was phenomenal. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 that's one of those weird ones where I never know if people if people felt that or not. I mean, I, I, I worked hard at that, and if people didn't get quite the gothic thing out of it, people seemed to at least respond to Kill City itself, and that makes me very happy. Well, it's got to be intense for you. You have, you know, such a long series, 
there's like, you know, there's a responsibility you got to feel on your shoulders at this point. Yes, very much to the characters and to the readers. I don't want to let anybody down. And uh, I know the rest of the series now. There is an end point. I know where it's going. And I think. Oh, exciting. I, I, I think people will like it. I, I think where we're headed is interesting enough that if you're already a fan, I think you'll be happy where, where it's going. Do you happen to know how many more books? Or uh, uh, Yes, I do. And I will not tell you. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. But it, it's, few. It, it's not like a ton. It's, okay. not like a, it's not like it's going to be 20 books or something like that. There are a f- uh, I'm writing book nine now, and there will be a few more after. And that's all I'll say. Okay. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> um, I saw you posted today that you're getting a uh, tattoo at Dragon Con. Yeah, by James Ray Tuck. Uh, who's also a writer, which is what really why I wanted it, because he's going to be there. I love the idea of being tattooed by a tattoo artist who's also a writer. That I love that idea thing. too. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you know? And you're, do you do you know what you're going to get? Yep, uh, it's my probably the uh, geekiest tattoo uh, I have. I, I will have uh, after Dragon Con. Uh, I'm a big fan of David Lynch. I'm a big fan of Twin Peaks. And I, I'm one of the few people on Earth who liked the movie Fire Walk With Me. And if you remember, at one point, there's a scene in a, a trailer park in which is an old car covered in dust. And someone has scrawled Let's Rock on the, uh, yeah. on the windshield as kind of a, you know, a come on from, from the killer. And I've always loved the look of that and, and just the phrase. So I'm going to get that. I'm going to get a tattoo of that. That's awesome. On your hand? No, the uh, crook of my right arm. Oh, okay. I'm getting some, I'm getting some work on my hand. I have a little work on my hand, but the new stuff will be completely different. That's exciting. Tattoos are so fun. I'm building a sleeve right now. Cool. Do you have a, an overall plan for it? Or are you doing it one piece at a time? I have an overall plan for it, but it's funny. My ideas turned out to be bigger than my arm. So what, tur- <laughs> so what, uh-huh. yeah, as just, it was just going to be one sleeve. It's now going to be two sleeves that go together. Cool. Cool. Uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's kind of like a storybook turned upside down. So like I've taken different things from different books and um, like I have a Hobbit hole, but it's in the clouds. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I'm going to have like a whole sky theme and then it goes into the ground. going to try to figure out how to get Totoro in there somehow. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. I have uh, an appointment in, uh, my next appointment is in August. And I'm going to have like this tattered version of Alice falling down my arm, dropping a bottle. But in the bottle is a whale. Oh, nice, nice. Um, and uh, she's going to be kind of surrounded by soot sprites. So I couldn't be any more excited. That sounds terrific. You can't go wrong with, with, with Alice stuff. You really I mean, can't. You really can't. I mean, that's why I had an Alice in Sandman Slim. I mean, the, the plan was to do, the original plan was to do um, a bunch of Alice in Wonderland stuff. But then the, the Tom Waits song got stuck in my head, and that ended up uh, taking over from Alice in Wonderland. But it was definitely inspired by, uh, by you know, Lewis Carroll's Alice. Yes, that's awesome. But yeah, um, that Tom Waits song is awesome. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I was actually, yeah, I was just, I've been uh, working on a short story about a dying wizard, and I've been listening to a lot of Tom Waits. It can be really inspiring. I mean, that that sh- the change with Swordfish Trombones was just am- amazing to me. I mean, I liked him up till then, but then to hear that new stuff, I mean, Swordfish Trombones to uh, Rain Dogs was mm-hmm. just the most exciting was some of the most exciting music I'd ever heard. Well, and as far as like atmospheric power, like it really just like it warms the room and, you know, like light a candle and like, I can just pretend like I'm in a cabin. It's awesome. Yeah. Pretty much <clears throat> Tom Waits and Nick Cave are probably my favorite overall people to listen to. Nice. Do you, and do you listen to music when you write or do you tend not to? Yes. Um, but I tend to listen to instrumental stuff. I I can listen to some stuff with lyrics for brief periods if I'm writing, if it works with what I'm writing at that moment. But overall, I really prefer just sound. So I'll listen to... Um, Lindsay Sterling. I'm sorry? 
if you listen to Lindsay Sterling, she's one of my favorite instrumentals to listen to while writing. No, I don't know who that is. No. Really? Oh, you yeah. should definitely check her out. There's also, there's a new uh, music video um, and it's very like Mad Max meets, because she's a violinist. Okay. Um, But it's, yeah, you should definitely check it out. Lindsay Sterling? Yep. Okay. I'll write that down. Thank you. Oh, definitely. You know, I, I found out about her. She was, um, it was, her music was behind like a WoW compilation um, and yeah, definitely check her out. I will, definitely. Yeah, I tend to listen to people like Lustmord, the uh, sort of dark ambient musician. Um, I listen to a lot of what's called Doom Jazz, um, which is uh, the best band for Doom Jazz is a, a group called Boren and Der Club of Gore. Which <laughs> I'll have to check like that metal, out. <laughs> it sounds like a metal band, but it is not. Their best album is Black Earth. The way they were first described to me is, imagine a small cafe band that have been locked in David Lynch's basement for 10 years. Oh. And that's kind of what they sound like. And it's it's just great haunting dark stuff. I will definitely have to check that out. I like haunting haunting and dark. It's it's great stuff, man. Black Earth is is, is the one to start with. Will do. I made a note. Back to a little bit of you Stark's um, inner battle without getting into spoilers. But as yeah. far as like in, internal battles, I mean, I believe that's something that everyone deals with. Did you find it cathartic in any way to kind of work out? Oh, yeah. I mean... Sorry if that was... I phrased that kind of... No, I, I think I know what you're talking about. And yeah, um, Stark's... Not all of Stark's opinions are my opinions, which I like to tell people because Stark has a lot of damn opinions. <laughs> and I don't, I don't agree with all of them all the time. So it's not always me talking. It is Stark talking at times. But um, on the other hand... A lot of the stuff Stark deals with internally um, has been stuff I've dealt with. I mean, I was raised in a religious background that I ended up rejecting pretty young, but that sticks with you. And I have an interest base. I have a very basic interest in belief systems. So the religious stuff was something that means that that means something to me. And some of the again, the PTSD stuff, um, there's some there's a fair amount of violence in my background. And working through some of that stuff, you know, uh, watching Stark do it and thinking about it is something that uh, means it, it means something to me too. to watch someone try to get past some of that crap. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, my, my question kind of stemmed from the fact that, like, you know, my fiction, like what you said, my fiction is fiction. But emotion, the real like emotion inside of me tends to find its way out, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think even unconsciously we start doing that stuff. I mean, I didn't sit down and say, hey, I'm going to write about a guy with, you know, a, a difficult background who will try to find some cure for it. But it, it, it just kind of happened. No, I hear you. No, I uh, I had set out to write a an article about, um, you know, medication and um, in children and I yeah. ended up writing this full-on essay piece about my issues with my mom. And I was like, oh, well, I'll send that to a different place. <laughs> yeah, that happened that too. Yeah. I, when you reach for entertainment to unwind, what, what is it that you reach for? I collect movies. Uh, I, I certainly read a lot of books. I'm reading some graphic novels right now. I'm, re I'm reading Monstrous. By, oh, that's, uh, on my, that's on my to-read list. It's really good. It's really, really good. Um, I, a friend of mine just gave me Bitch Planet, which looks great. Um, re, going back to Fatal by Ed Brubaker, those are um, some really, really, uh, those are ones. Oh, and, and, and Grant Morrison's The Nameless. That's, or Nameless. That, that's fabulous. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, right now, I don't have a lot of chance to read novels. So that's why graphic novels work for me. Uh, I, I, all the novels I read right now tend to be for blurbs, things like that. Also, because I'm, I'm writing a book right now, so it's hard to read novels. But I'll tell you one that's not out yet that you should really look for. And that is um, Lost Gods by Brom, B-R-O-M. Okay. Yep. He's uh, an artist and a writer, which pisses me off. <laughs> yep. I, I often wish that I had artistic talent outside of stick figures yeah he's really good and this is i think his best book lost gods 
Awesome. I think that's out in September. And if you like dark fantasy, um, kind of Southern Gothic dark fantasy, I think you'd like this. Oh, nice. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's up my alley. I was rereading all the Wasteland because I had Anthony Johnson on the show a few weeks back and uh, I was uh, reading, I had read those a while ago, but I was reading them again and that's uh, some awesome post-apocalyptic stuff there. It's nice to be able to go back to that stuff, especially if you go back to it and kind of go, hey, this still works for me. And that's, that's always exciting. It is. I, well, and I have a few things where I, it, that's always like Walking Dead, for instance, I am um, I've rewatched and reread those comics so many times. It's insane. Don't tell me anything about it because I still haven't on my DVR are still the last few episodes of the previous season, which I have not made it through yet. So uh, I don't want to hear anything about it. I will. I will respect that wholeheartedly. I, All right. I, I, uh, I myself um, watch it out of sequence. Because I like to avoid commercials and stuff, and I tend, uh, right. and I tend to get like the iTunes pass where it's like you get it the the day or two after. Okay, so sure. yeah, when uh, the season is hot, I'm often avoiding Twitter feeds. Yeah, that's really hard. I forget there are some nights where I have to just turn off all my social media and uh, do something else. Because uh, yeah, between back when I used to watch Game of Thrones, it was the same way. Oh, did but you stop? I got fed up with Game of Thrones. Did you? Yeah. A little too much rape for me. Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, it's a bit heavy there. I, so I'm a late ad adapter. I only started watching it. <laughs> well, everyone tells me that the moment I quit watching it, it got better. So. Well, th yeah. that's always the case, I feel like. I, I, yeah. I even say that to people. Like, oh, but you should go back because it gets better. Well, maybe maybe I'll go back at some point, but I'm just I have too much stuff going on now and too much stuff to to watch. I you know I haven't I haven't finished Better Call Saul either. Oh wow! I, you know, and I have I collect movies and I have <laughs> you know there's so much to watch, so much to read, so much to write. I know. I'm always saying that like we need to get on the fact like if we had like eight more hours to every day, so much more would be possible. Absolutely. And I wouldn't have to, um, you know, I would wish that I could clone myself less if I had more time. So I'm, I'm envious of those people. I have friends who sleep like four and five hours a night and, and function perfectly. And I wish I could do that. Well, I would I do. I have why well, I, I have all sorts of sleep issues. So I tend to be around like four or five. But some days I function better than others. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I, I have days at a time when I don't sleep much, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not always functional after a couple of those. Yeah, no, things start looking pretty grim. If I like when I go on, like I'm start going on like day four, day five. Yeah. But I find that there's still things you can do. I mean, at my worst, I can still, I can't write necessarily, but I can at least play with the story. Like what's What's going on with this character? What's the next thing this person's going to do? There's always work that you can do. It's just maybe not the actual writing of the story itself, at least for me. No, definitely. Actually, well, I mean, and I'm really, uh, I just started writing full time in September. I, mm -hmm. I I had just made the uh, the switch. And I'm still figuring out a lot of different ways to do things. But uh, that's one thing that I actually learned it, I, that recently basically that you can there's lots to do and sometimes you can really limit yourself by focusing on like oh i have to do this one thing well if that's not jiving there's a million other things that can be done that you know might work better at the moment absolutely absolutely you just have to figure out what that thing is you can do at that moment and, and not beat yourself up if it's not you know, the, the main project you, you should, or you think you should be working on. Yep. Yeah. Learning that. Well, and in general, like that can, I feel like that can be that way with just story writing too, is mm -hmm. if you, you push yourself in one direction for, you know, this basic idea that you think that's where you should go, you end up like, you know, kind of pushing against an actual real route to, you know, go there. Yeah. I mean, it's always good to have, more than one thing going at a time. It doesn't mean to work on two things at a time. That can be deadly. But to have something else you can go to for those moments when the the, the big project isn't working so you can still stay creative. 
short fiction is great for that as well. Exactly. Exactly. So if you're working on a book, you know, have a story you're playing with at the same time. Don't take time from the book to, 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 to write the story. But if there's a moment in the story where you're, you have to pause, yeah, having something else to sort of keep your mind going and keep the writing process going is, is kind of a good idea. No, I'm, um, I have a full length that's in someone else's hands at the moment, and I'm focusing all of my crazies on various short fiction, and I'm finding it quite nice. Yeah, I don't get to write stories that often, but it's always fun. It's nice because Ellen Datlow is, is my favorite anthology uh, editor, and she's asked me for a few stories. And so it's always great to have an excuse to stop and write a story for Ellen. Mm -hmm. And That's I've written, awesome. I think, two of my best stories for her. Oh, nice. That's really cool. No, me and uh, a friend of mine were co-writing a anthology taking it's all different weird tales in Washington State because we're, we're <laughs> we both live here and that's just been fun. It sounds like it. Good stuff. Um, one thing about the perdition score is I I love um candy. Yeah, I love candy too. The whole deal. She was someone. I knew it was going to be there from the beginning. I mean, she's in Sandman Slim, mm -hmm. the first book. But I didn't know what her future was going to be until the third book. And then it just sort of seemed obvious to me, like where where this had been going, where she was going, where Stark was going. And it's been great to be able to write more about her. She's one of the projects I want to do when I get a chance to write a story. I have a candy solo story I want to do. Oh, that's exciting. I'll definitely yeah, be looking I, I for that. I write about her and the Jades. Awesome. Because I don't get a chance to just sort of, you know, I can't just sort of stop a Sandman Slim novel and go <laughs> on about like, well, here's the history of the Jade. <laughs> um, so if I could get a chance, when I get a chance to write this story, uh, it'll be, Stark will be in there for like 10 seconds and then all the rest of it's Candy and her Jade friends. Oh, that sounds like it'll be fun. I think so. I think so. Now, when you get all these ideas that pop up and you can't work on them, do you write a few sentences down of them somewhere so you can come back to it? Or do you tend to just let them sit? And if they are persistent enough, you'll get to them. No, I, I write everything down. Uh, I try not to ever throw anything away because even if it seems like a dumb idea at the time, you don't know if a year later that dumb idea might, it might still be a dumb idea. But there might be some fragment of it that works for, for something you're writing. You know, um, a character, a setting, mm -hmm. some tiny bit of it that might be useful. So don't, I, I, for writers, I recommend don't throw anything away. You don't have to show it to anybody because <laughs> um, it might feel really dumb. Uh, you, you, you can just keep it in your notebooks, online, whatever you want. So, uh, you know, you have access to your thought process and ruthlessly steal from yourself. <laughs> that 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 would be a good sentence on a t-shirt. There you go. <laughs> um, no, totally. Well, even just a whole bunch of words that end up, those words you can't use, they spur something that, you know, is what you need. It's, uh, yeah. it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, free association sometimes can be really good. I think, uh, I think once you are used to writing once you're confident at it your unconscious can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you in terms of story and plot and character and um so keeping all that material around and just feed your unconscious um can be very very useful i i can plan out a story i can plan out a book but usually something will intrude uh, a better idea will come along that makes me change the original idea, the original outline. And that I always feel like is my unconscious saying, no, this is a better direction to go in. And it's usually right. Well, and then I think that's the importance of really being familiar with your world and your characters is that you're kind of able to just kind of follow the the gut there in a lot of ways. Yeah. I Even when I outline, I, I outline all my books, but I always, I always try to remind younger writers if you outline, you don't owe the outline anything. You can throw the outline out. But when I do outline, um, I always leave holes in there because sometimes I don't know what happens in this transition. Sometimes I just like to leave 
places for myself to discover something. I'll, I'll create a little quandary somewhere in the story. And it's like, I know that between now and then, I will see the connections coming. And uh, if I try to plan out that moment, I won't have something good. But if I let it come to me, and again, this is the uncon- working with your unconscious. If I let that one moment come to me as I'm writing, it will be a more interesting um, it would be a more interesting answer than if I just sat there pounding my head, trying to get something logical. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, an outlining can be used as a map too, as far as once you have the first draft and you need to go in and move things around, it's, it's easier to not get, you know, lost. Mm-hmm. Wow. Absolutely. I like outlines, but like I said, you know, no one owes the outline anything. Well, that's really good advice. Cause that is, that is a fine line to, cause I mean, Outlining is good, but at the same time, if you, like you said, you can, you know, end up bogging yourself down with, you know, these certain scenes that you thought of while you were making yourself think of scenes rather than naturally discovering them when it's time. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I like to have some kind of armature to hang the story on, but um, it's fun to be able to improvise, too. And that's what that's what I consider the... Um, the unconscious parts of, um, of the writing process, the little improvs along the way that make the story more interesting. Because I figure if I if I surprise myself, I have a good chance of surprising the readers. That feels like a pretty solid philosophy. My first instinct is this is a Vonnegut a quote from a Vonnegut, but um, you need a midpoint to hang your story on. Yeah, absolutely. You need that that that, that pivot point. Mm-hmm. And I learned some of that from script writing. I enjoy writing scripts too. And in fact, I'm going to be doing a lot of script writing once I finish this new book. And yeah, that, that's an important thing I learned from working on uh, screenplays is that that pivot point where everything seems headed in one direction. And then one, one little thing might come along that transforms what the story is, perhaps for you and you hope for the readers. Mm-hmm. Playing with dormant chain of events. Yeah. Uh, screenplay writing, more of that. That's exciting. I like writing scripts and I want to get more into it. So, yeah, I'll be finished with this book in August and the rest of the year is going to be mostly scripts. A few stories, but mostly scripts. Nice. Getting back and doing a screenplay with a friend and doing some comic work. Very cool. That's exciting. I love comics, so I really <laughs> want to get back into that. Nice. Well, I mean, the whole, like all of it, it's such a deep world and the possibilities are endless. It's fun to have your hands in different stuff. It is. Plus, I also think if you're going to make your living as a writer, you know, on a purely um, commercial, not commercial authority, a a level in which you can continue to make your living as a writer. I think I think you need to be in more more than one place these days. Um, Yeah. The idea of. You know, the idea of just making your living as a novelist, I think is, is, I don't know if it's over, if you're big enough, if you're Stephen King, (laughs) for anyone younger than that, I think it's, I think it's really hard. And even Stephen King has, has written movie scripts. I think diversification is the future for freelance writers trying to learn to do more than one thing. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Um, it's, uh, it's a changing world we're in for sure. I mean, it has changed so much in the last 10 years. I have no idea what it's going to look like in another 10. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, trying to do as many different things as possible makes a lot of sense to me. Plus it keeps you interested, Mm -hmm. keeps, keeps your brain working in different ways. And I think that's always a good idea. Definitely. No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got my hands in a mess of projects right now and I'm just having a blast because, uh, you know, if I'm done looking at one thing, I go on to the other thing and it's just, uh, I keep rolling. And it's nice. Like one of the scripts I'm working on is with a friend and I'm finding myself more interested in collaboration, which is the other reason comics and film interest me is it's not just me sitting in a room, creating the world all by myself (laughs) as in a book. It's attractive, isn't it? It's it's fun to do to to create your own world with a novel, but it's also really nice to work with other people and see those other points of view and ending up with something that neither one of you 
would have done on your own. That is some brand new thing that's, that's, that's a combination of both of your brains and passions. Definitely. No, collaboration is something that I've been experimenting more with recently as well. And it's really fun to be able to, you know, take that like creative ball and bounce it back and forth. And then you end up with, you know, a snowman. Exactly. Well, Richard, can you tell everybody where they can find you and your books? Sure. Uh, you can find me on, um, well, you can find my books pretty much anywhere. Um, you could, you know, they're in Barnes and Noble and they're at Amazon online. I always recommend people try to go to their local independent bookstore. It's always a good place to start. A lot of them will order it for you. But other places they can find me. Um, I'm on Facebook as Richard Cadry. I have a second Facebook page called Richard Cadry's Writing Page that's more specifically about craft and books. The first one is just whatever weird crap falls out of my head. <laughs> You can find me on Twitter at Richard underscore Cadre. Uh, I'm on Instagram as R Cadre, and I, I'm doing Snapchat now, which is kind of fun. <laughs> I'm still and learning it. I'm still learning it too, but I, but I, I've, I'm having a little bit of fun with it. And on Snapchat, I'm Saint Gomi, S A I N T G O M I, and uh, you can follow me there if you want. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was super fun talking to you. It was great talking to you, too. Thanks for asking me. Well, that wraps it up for now, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Let me know what you think of the show. Reviews are always appreciated. Reach out to me on Twitter at MeBettingField or the show at Too Many Words Pod. Go to the Facebook page. And, of course, you can go to my site, jamiebettingfield.com. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time.